Hi, good morning. Thanks so much for joining me in my shop here. Hey, the last couple of days I haven't been in here to do any work, and the reason is I rebuilt my antenna outside my house, which I often complain about on these videos, and I switched from a uh, dipole, a 20 meter band uh, dipole hanging in my backyard to a large loop uh, going around my property, and the result is it's a whole new world of shortwave listening for me. I can't believe it. It's, I think it's pretty clear to me now that the last 30, 40 years of my life, since, since, since I lived in downtown Toronto in a high-rise building and I had a huge antenna on top of the roof of a 20-story building, uh, since that time, they'd be the late 70s into the very early 80s till, till now, I've had lousy antennas. I think that's the case. You know, most of us struggle with our little property and trying to put an antenna out there. And uh, wow. Okay. So anyway, I won't go on about it at length. But fantastic. I, uh, I I have this great antenna. And guess what? It's actually affecting here in the shop. There's a lead that comes into the shop from this antenna, and I've checked it, and it's all thumbs up. So that's what I've been doing the last couple of days fiddling around with an antenna which I'm sure will, will have an impact in here. Now, uh, today what I want to do is I want to start changing these capacitors and uh, weather's bad today, I'll be indoors all day. I think I'm going to try to get them all changed, all the uh, molded capacitors, all the paper capacitors, get all changed and out of here. Uh, I'm going to start at the very front end. There's three molded capacitors and uh, couple other paper ones they all look terrible so I think I'm gonna concentrate on the, the front of the radio but first I'm gonna go through the schematic and just uh, I haven't done this yet go through the schematic in detail in fact I'm gonna go through the whole radio manual for this uh, this radio and uh, we'll, we'll take take a look at all the information quickly but mostly we'll just get through the schematic here okay so here we go with a quick uh, quick quick overview of the uh, whole manual here. This is a great manual. There's the radio again with the three wooden bars of which only one remains. So here's the alignment procedure, a table with uh, information and guidance on how to do the alignment. Here's a layout diagram showing you where all the adjustments are hidden on here and other aspects, sort of big, big aspects of the radio, but this is where you go to find out where the different trimmers are located. Here's the dial on the face of the radio and this is the paper scale that's stuck on the back of the big wheel of the tuning capacitor and you can lay, it says right here, you can lay a ruler across here and find out that 70 on the paper means 10 you know, on the scale here, that kind of thing. There's the schematic, we're going to be going through that uh, shortly. Here's a component and wire layout diagram. Uh, these aren't terribly common. Uh, they, you do find them. They're really handy uh, at times. Uh, shows you how things should be laid out. There's some warnings in here. I'll see if I can find them. There's some important warnings in this in this uh, manual. So here's a uh, uh, socket voltage table for the different tubes and what voltages you should find. Plate voltage, screen voltage. And then just a table of the replacement part part numbers. Let's see if I can find that that statement before we look at the, uh, the this one here. Uh, precautionary precautionary lead dress. I think this is clearly this is obviously true of this radio, but it's probably generally true of all radios. So the lead from the second IF to the volume control should be kept close to the chassis. You know, we'll do, when we look at the back of the radio in a few minutes, uh, after going through the schematic to identify the specific capacitors I'm gonna be doing, we'll look, we'll look for these things. Lead, so the wire coming from the second IF to the volume control should be close to the chassis. The RF coil leads should be kept short and away from the coil. I guess that should be the coil. never never heard of that I mean keeping leads short is a general rule all the time leads to the six uh, 
six thousand. What, what is that? Is that a that's a point? And that is six microfarad. What is that? Six thousand should be kept as short as possible and a condenser dressed away from the chassis, bearing against the ten ohm resistor. Now think about that for a minute. You know, this is never going to come into somebody's head on its own. You're never going to be fixing a radio and say, hey, see that capacitor? That should be laid up against this resistor over here. You may look in the back and see it that way because that's how it was done originally. But is it going to plug into your head that there's a reason for that? And these things haunt me. These, these kinds of things. There's probably 10 more of these in that radio, but just not very significant but all together do them all wrong and the radio's performance drops. This one is so critical. They've actually written it right in the manual here to tell people like me, hey, believe it or not, you should stick that capacitor up against the 10 ohm resistor. And, and why this is all about uh, oscillation, noise creation, and noise uh, sensitivity and pickup. Uh, that, uh, un unwanted, so. And the rest of this is not not uh, so so that's really interesting stuff so we'll definitely look at these three things I can't I don't want to get these wrong either when I do work in the radio so uh, specific to this radio it may be general uh, to some degree okay that's great let's go look at the schematic now and we'll see how that looks uh, where is it here Oop. oh my little cat is crying to me I want to go outside, but it's wet and rainy out there. Right, Peanut? Okay, turns out the cat just wanted some food in the food bowl. Happy to stay inside today. So, let's start, like I said, with the power supply. So, you can't run a radio on 120 volts AC. you got to run it on uh, two or 300 volts DC. So, you got to make that somewhere. And that's what the power supply is doing. It's making the appropriate kind of voltage and power to run the radio. So here we are, in through the on-off switch here. There's that extra outlet, which is always on. The switch doesn't affect it. There's two ratings here, a 60 cycle transformer, 25 cycle transformer. Of course, I'll be sticking in the 60 cycle version, which, hey, I have it. I already have it. I have the replacement. It came already. So. So, but we're not going to put it in first. First we're going to tune this radio up, fix it all up, then we're going to stick this transformer in. So out of the other side are three windings, one, two, and three. This one is feeding the heaters to warm up all the tubes. 6.3 volts, about a half an amp per tube, so that's about three watts per tube. Uh, heating, uh, the output tube a little more, and this five volts runs the heater on the rectifier tube only and the reason that it has its own winding here, its own se separate winding, is because it's actually held at voltage. Um, so, see, there's going to be a high voltage here. It's going to come right in. This whole winding is running at a high voltage relative to this winding. So, anyway, that's why it has a separate winding, just the way things are done here. There's no separate cathode in the tube, blah, blah, blah. Onward. So, at this point, we have some high voltage, something above 230, so maybe 250, 260 here, 270, I don't know. Comes into this filter, goes through the speaker field coil. This chokes out more of the hum, if you like. Another filter here, small, capac small filter capacitor. And then we have now nice, smooth, high voltage DC ready to run the tubes. So from here, the voltage is fed into each tube, uh, into the plate, and maybe screen if it's there, off of this line right here. So this, so we follow, here we go, straight in, it goes around to the SG screen, screen grid, around here, through the primary winding of the uh, speaker uh, output transformer. Oh, come on. Okay, so there's DC flowing through here, up into the plate, that's all, that's all. This tube here, uh, what are they going to say? They won't say it. So, but this is the guy that's doing all the power. This is the heavy working tube. He's working hard to make the speaker go. The hum neutralization coil in the voice coil, which is one of the reasons why these radios tend to not hum. Uh, 
So uh, what else can we find here? Well, look. So it has a bypass capacitor, fairly large, 20. Look, this is a larger capacitor than the ones in the power supply. A 20 microfarad uh, across this resistor. The resistor is 470 ohms. We got to check this guy. We'll, we'll, we'll get to him. We'll get to him for sure. But typically, these resistors, uh, they, they get into trouble. Hard-working resistors. So that's basically the power supply producing some AC voltage to run the heaters, a big high DC voltage to run the actual tube itself, and a little bit of voltage to run the heater in, in this tube. Okay, and the pilot light down here too. So now we'll follow the antenna inwards. No, no, no. Next thing was to look at the oscillator. So uh, all all these radios, uh, super headsets, have a oscillator inside them its own little radio station inside the radio that produces a frequency close to the one you're tuned to in fact uh, in fact it's exactly 455 kilohertz away from the frequency that's indicated on the pointer on the front of the radio so if you tune your radio to uh, uh, a thousand uh, on the AM band like like a million hertz or a thousand kilohertz right in the middle of the band. But what you're really doing is you're changing the frequency of this oscillator here. Uh, it'll be running 1 million plus 455. Maybe it's 460 in this radio. 1 million plus 460. So 1.460 kilohertz will be generated within the radio uh, through, through, these, through these coils and capacitors. And it's fed up into this tube, the mixer tube. So we'll talk a little more about this in a, min in a minute, but this this is the oscillator area, if you like. Now we'll look at the antenna. So here's the antenna. The antenna being a piece of wire. Uh, in my case, I was uh, uh, congratulating myself on the fantastic luck with my new antenna, which has made a huge, huge difference in my radio listening. Great. That's my antenna there. Comes down, comes down, comes down, connects directly to this coil and then down to the chassis. So that's really the antenna right there. It, it's really, uh, be careful what I say here, it's not really connected directly into the radio. It's just coming down, feeding a signal into this coil. What's going on with this coil? So these coils are all close together on one form, forming one RF transformer, this being the primary, and each of these being a secondary, A, B, and C secondaries. A, B, C is probably broadcast band, shortwave one, shortwave two. That's probably how this is. And we'll probably find out somewhere in here. Notice down here, these coils labeled the same way, A, B, C. So when you throw the switch, here's part of the switch. Here's more of the switch. When you rotate this switch, you are selecting which of these coils you're going to use. Now there's four up here and three down here. You're only selecting three. This coil is always connected to the antenna. So basically the antenna signal, the radio signal you're after is, is, uh, is in this coil and uh, in interacting from this coil into these coils. So let's pretend we're selected, we're going to select uh, AM radio. I believe it's this coil here, L3. So this switch is set now to AM. This coil is selected this coil selected. This thing is now creating an oscillation in the radio somewhere 460 hertz above the tuned spot on the dial. That's what will be going on. These coils are probably shorted to ground or left open or who knows. Who knows what? They're probably shorted to ground. I don't know. But they're not being used. Notice these coils, short wave 1, short wave 2, have trimmers against them. There's no trimmer against this coil. The trimmer for this coil really is the main trimmer, the main trimmer on the tuning capacitor, 2 to 20 picofarad tuning capacitor. Tuning capacitor has two sections. This one is tuning the antenna, all this stuff, tuning all this stuff. The other part, can we find it? Um, can we find it here? The, the other, the other part. I got this wrong. 
this is this is the tuning capacitor. This is the trimmer. I think I was backwards on it. It's got a little bit of a curved arrow. So we got to find another another capacitor with a curved arrow on it. What what happened to it? So that's indicating a tuned slug down here. And you got trimmers for each of the coils. A slug, maybe only related to the B coil or the A coil. Maybe it's only related to the A coil here. I'm not sure what this is indicating. Or it's all three of them. I don't know. We'll, we'll find out when we when we get. Oh, there it is. There it is. There, <laughs> found it. So there's the other part of the tuned capacitor there. That's the big capacitor with the plates you can see in the radio. So when you tune the tuning dial, this capacitor changes value, changes the resonant point of the oscillator circuit here, and changes the frequency of the local oscillator on this part of the tuning capacitor. The other part is tuning the front end of the radio. Now these two things have to align, which is where that word align comes from. And sometimes you can get these things to line up have one part of the band, maybe the high end, but at the low end, they, they don't line up properly. The radio will not work well. It will be insensitive. Okay, so so, uh, so what do we got going now? So we have the antenna signal. It's, it's getting into these coils. We're pretending we're switched to the A coil. So the, the signal from the antenna is transformed into this coil. Coming out, coming out, coming up here. This is the tuning capacitor that's working against these coils to produce a resonance that we're looking for. And then the signal goes through this little capacitor here. I'm a little worried about this capacitor in particular. And then onto the grid of this tube. And the signal coming up from the local oscillator, pretty sure it comes up through here. There's another one of those capacitors, I think, 56. See what I mean by one of those. It says here, O G. So this tube has two grids in it. What's that signal? What's S? Screen grid. So S G is screen grid. Here, never mind that. Go back to this. So we have the local oscillator coming in on this grid, and then we have the signal coming in on this grid. And there's a suppressor in here and a couple of. Uh, screens, I think. Um, the result is all these signals are coming in on these grids, everything from the antenna and a local oscillator, all get combined in this tube. And they combine it in a mathematical way. The signals add together and you get a new signal. You still have the old signals too. And also the difference between them is created in this tube and comes out. So let me make this really clear. Uh, let's say we're tuned to uh, around uh, Toronto here. There's a station called 1010. Okay, so we tuned to 1010, just above a million. So we got 1010 tuned here. Down here, we've tuned not 1010, but 1010 plus 460, which would be 10470. So that's the frequency that's coming out of here. These two signals meet in this tube. But there's more coming along from the antenna than just the 1010. Now you are tuning tuning this, so you're rejecting things that are far away from 1010. They're just too weak to, to, to be worried about. But very close to 1010, some more stuff could be coming in. Million, 900, other things are coming in on here. Depends how good the tuning is here. Okay, all that stuff comes in here. It all gets mixed together. So uh, mixed together in the sense that the original signals come through that tube, plus the difference between the original signals and the sum of the original signals come through. And they're all present, they're all exist on the plate here. So the whole schmozzle here of stuff, right here. But we're only interested in whatever happens to be at 460 kilohertz. Because the rest of the radio is only sensitive to 460 kilohertz. So you can present anything you like here in terms of frequency, like the original 1010 may be sitting here, but it can't get through the rest of the radio. It's rejected. The only thing that's going to go through is the 460. 
that's the difference between the local oscillator and what's coming on the antenna. Didn't explain that very well, but I'm going to leave it at that. Let's carry on now. So coming out of here, there's a bunch of signals, as I was just saying, but we're only going to pay attention to the 460 version of the signal coming out here. I'm going to go through this transformer primary, induce a signal in the secondary, it's going to be fed to the grid. There it is, fed to the grid. This guy is the main booster or amplifier in the radio. He's going to pump up the signal strength quite a bit and send it off to these. Uh, this transformer, same thing's going to happen. The signal is going to go through the primary. It's going to be transformed into the secondary. Things get interesting now. We go to this multi-purpose tube here. Two purposes in this tube. Two in one. It could be two separate tubes here, but they've managed to get them under one glass envelope. Uh, very commonly done in, in most of these radios. So the signal coming out of here has a RF, is an RF signal at 460 kilohertz. It's fed through these diodes here. I I can put it that way. And the result is you get a, a rectified version of the RF signal coming out here. The rectified signal, you can recover the audio from it. You cannot recover the audio from an unrectified signal. Uh, not, not in any kind of easy way that I know of anyway. I don't know of any way. This is how it's done. You chop off half the signal and the other half you can then use to, to extract the audio. And that's what's going on right in this area here. Also, because the signal is rectified here into DC, that DC becomes available and useful. You can create a negative voltage relative to the chassis here. Uh, just and you can throw it away and ignore it, or you can utilize it as a volume automatic volume control back on these tubes, and that's what all these radios do. So you'll see the signal is coming and heading through the volume control and heading off in the direction of the speaker, but there's something else going the other way, going to the front of the radio. Kind of weird. You hook up this part of the radio to the front again, but what you're really doing is conveying the uh, uh, DC voltage that's built up here. And this capacitor here is trying to knock out any RF that's still left here and dump it into the chassis so it doesn't show up. Notice a large resistor here, 5.6 mega ohms, uh, isolating away the low impedance circuitry here from the very high impedance of the grid circuits here. The grids are generally very high impedance. So have one mega ohm here, 5 mega ohms here, a bit of a voltage divider. Uh, is it? Yes, because of this. So the DC at this point finds its way onto the grid here and finds its way onto the grid here. The DC goes up and down with signal strength because it's a rectified version of the signal coming through the radio. Stronger the radio signal, more rectification, more DC voltage, more negative grid, more negative grid, less gain less gain, you can see how this becomes a governor for the strength of the radio output. Yeah. That's why, and people, I'm sure most people have no idea what's going on, that's why when you tune at an AM radio, you tune between stations, you hear all this incredible noise. But when you tune in a station, the noise is driven away. It's really because the automatic volume control is going up and down. So between stations, the radio turns itself up full blast, basically and a little bit of noise comes through the speaker loud and clear. If you didn't have this, when you tune between stations, the radio would go quiet. Unless you unless you turn the volume way up. Okay, where are we now? So now we've got, at, at this point, we've separated out the rectified DC, sent it off to do its job to control the volume of the radio, and the audio is now going to go this way. You notice the audio signal can split this way and that way. It's not going to want to go this way. A great big resistor here. So it's going to go this way. Even though this is a fair size resistor too. This is a one meg uh, resistor. So the audio is uh, 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 picked off here. The volume control selects how much of the volume will be, how much of the signal will be sent forward. 10, 10 meg resistor here because this is a grid, 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 grid up to here. So now we're leaving 
the volume control, it looks like we're heading back into the same tube, but really we're going into a different part of the same tube, which is really two tubes in one. This goes through a triode to boost up its signal strength and make it capable of driving the output tube grid. So out comes the signal here. Da -da 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 -da. Gets to here. Look, a tone control. What's going on here? This tone control leaks some of the signal into ground through this resistor. And this capacitor is controlled. The size is picked to leak uh, the higher frequencies to ground. So basically, you have a full spectrum signal coming here. Some of the higher frequencies gets peeled off here. And what do you hear? You hear less treble as you turn this control closer and closer to ground here. Like if you put it right to ground, and then a lot of the high frequencies will just be knocked off here, and you'll hear a muffled output, typical of a tone control. We get to this tube. This tube is the hard, hard working tube here. Uh, it gets its grid bias through this cathode resistor, which in, in, so instead of pushing the grid negative relative to the cathode, this resistor raises the cathode positive relative to the grid. The grid itself is probably tied right to the chassis. Where is it? Here it is. Okay, well it's tied to the chassis through this tone control. So a little bit of an unusual arrangement here. Um, usually these tone controls are a little earlier in the radio, but this is how they've done it with this one. And uh, so essentially the grid is running at um, the at zero, zero volts. But what if these capacitors are a little leaky? So for instance, what's on this wire here? Just look down here and go, oh my gosh, well, the whole power supply, 250 volts, is on here. Pushing on this capacitor. Potentially pushing on this grid. Grid is high impedance, which means it takes a very small charge. Just a little bit of coulombic action here, and the voltage on this will change. So a little bit of a leak in this capacitor under the pressure of 250 volts pushing on it, a little bit of a charge, and throw off the grid voltage here. Raise it up positive. And I guess that'll snuff out the radio uh, volume. The volume will go down, I think. But the other thing about making the grid positive, you know, I'm not sure, to be honest with you, whether the volume would go down or not, but the quiescent current, the steady state current going through, will start going up. and you'll. Silent, it's the silent killer of these tubes. This guy is too. He's also another silent killer. But this, the, these, both these capacitors combined uh, need to be 100%. So a little different with the rest of the tubes here uh, in terms of how they bias themselves, where they get their voltage from. But this guy here, got to take care of him. Okay, so where are we at now? We've reached the end of the road pretty well. We just have a signal coming out of the plate, a uh, fairly high high tension signal. So to change the impedance, we use a transformer, or they use a transformer. Drop down the impedance to somewhere around 5, 8 ohms, which is what this coil is. Oh look, it says right on, 3.1 ohms right here. And uh, presto, the speaker works, and you listen to the radio. So okay, I got my way through it. You know what? This diagram is going to be really helpful because I'm going to be able to use this to identify the various uh, parts that I'm about to change. So I want to go after these capacitors up here. Now that's a trimmer. That's a trimmer. See the line with the arrow through it? These are adjustable. All adjustable. I'm looking for fixed ones. Here's a fixed one. 56 picofarad. There's a fixed one here. That's one, two, three, four fixed ones. Now, I, I, uh, the guy, I'm going to flip back to the uh, camera in a second, and we'll look at the actual capacitors I'm after. And see if I can't figure out which is which here. Because I'm finding what look like four potentially molded capacitors. 
See, this guy's a lot bigger. It's just microfarads. This guy is micro microfarads. He's a much smaller capacitor. Well, maybe I just didn't spot the fourth one in the back of the radio. Let's go have a look. Okay, well, here's the back of the radio. <laughs> all these wires all over it um, because I've got it set up to all my test equipment, which I don't want to disturb. We're going to take a look at some of the capacitors down here with a close up camera and see if we can spot four of a very particular kind of capacitor. It's this kind. Right there, that black one with a number on it. Five, it looks like 560 to me. So that one's 560. And now, there's another one right here, and you can see the crack on it. See, it's cracked right open. So that's going to let moisture in there. I, I can't read the value of it, but its position is quite clear. It's it's hooked up to a tube pin. Oops, down here. Let me just put a little more light in my shop. One sec. Okay. Now there's a third one right down in here. Oh, look, it's laid up against a resistor. That's got to be the one that was uh, talked about. And resistor is a, let's see, body end dot. So body looks orange, end is black, dot is five, green, five. 30K, 30, I don't know, not sure. So that's three, now is there a fourth one? Is, is there a fourth one? I, I, just judge on the val judging by the values, should be another one in here somewhere. It's easier to look with my eyes, frankly. Then. Oh, way up in there. Nope. Okay, so there's one. There's one talked about. It must be a must be a paper version. There's there's a paper one right here pretty god-awful and there's one tucked away in the back there you just see the end of it awful looking things maybe one of those two okay so let's let's get to actually identifying which one's which we'll start with this this one this one here but I'm pretty sure it says 560 on it 560 it's hooked up to the band switch down here and that's one of these three trimmer adjustments here. So it goes between the band switch and a trimmer adjustment. Okay, let's let's flip over to the schematic here. We're looking for a 560 to begin with. There's a 560. Goes from you know, right into the switch, and the other the other end is to the trimmer, there it is. So that's definitely so that but that that's that. So we know that one. Now right off the switch is another one doing the same kind of thing, only it's a, a different size. So that's gotta be one of the other ones. I'm just looking here in my cell. Uh, pretty easy to see. There's a resistor in series with it. Does that make sense? I don't see any resistor here. Oh, you know what? I'm seeing this one because there's a resistor here. I'm seeing this one. And then, then here's one off the same wire. 6,000. Uh, okay. Uh, that, that's not a small capacitor. 6,000. So this is maybe the paper one here. Okay, let, let, let's jump back and look at the radio again. Okay, so we got the 560 there. Coming from the band switch down here up up to one of these capacitors. Now another one of these trimmer capacitors. 
has a lead coming off it. Okay, so there's this right here, this capacitor. Maybe that's the 6,000? Does it say 6,000 right on it? That could say 6,000 right there. Well, it could say almost anything under the sun, though, couldn't it? Just, with my eye, I see 6,000. Okay, that all makes sense. So that explains why I'm seeing three of these molded, but look like four in the radio. This one, this one is one of the molded ones, but it's not molded. Okay. So then, so if we look down in the switch. I don't know if you can see this or not. Can you see this? There's a resistor, and the resistor is coming up to this terminal, and from this terminal is the cracked one. So this is the one that's, and then it's heading out to uh, the one of these tubes here. This tube. That leaves the one that's laid up against the uh, resistor. Let me read that part again about this, this laid up one. I'll just leave that like that. That resistor got a big crack in the middle of it. So we want to read that special note again. Here it is. Leads leads to the 6000 C25 should be as short as possible and the condenser dressed away from the chassis bearing against the 10 ohm 10 ohm resistor R3. So it's C25 and R3 they're talking about. Uh, let's look on the uh, wiring diagram here. Come take a look at this. Come over here. C25 here's C25 and R3. C25, that's the big one, 6,000. And that's a uh, that's a molded one. Okay. The other side of R10 is this one. The other side of R10. Let's see if we can find this 10 ohm resistor. And I think I found it, but let's see if it really is. Is that a 10 ohm resistor? How do you get that to be 10 ohms? How does that come out 10? Um, body and dot. Well, the dot is green. <laughs> so maybe that's not the capacitor laid up against the. Uh, Resistor. I'm going to take a little resistance reading here, and we'll see what we get. Ten ohms, eh? more than 20k and I was what was I guessing I was guessing it was uh, 10, 10, 10, 10 K I can't remember 30 K I can't remember one mega ohm one mega ohm It'd be a uh, uh, body and dot brown black One mega. So, so what what's going on here? Uh, okay, uh, let's go back. Um, let's go back to the schematic here. Okay, so the capacitor and resistor that are laid up against each other is uh, in the radio. The ones I'm looking at, not the ones talked about in the manual here is this capacitor, C5, and this resistor, R1, 1 megaohm, connected to the grid here. 
So the fact that, that this is laid up against this, does it mean anything? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, it, it probably doesn't. It's not talked about, but it's definitely there. And it's kind of obvious that it's laid up against it. I have to find now this capacitor and this resistor. These are the two that are... No, I'm sorry. Uh, I think it's this one and this should be laid up against each other. 10 ohms. Okay, I'm going to go find that. So, we know... What do we know? So we know this resistor, this is pin number 8. This 8, 7, 6, 5. Uh, looks like this cracked one is connected to it. Yeah, kind of see how the wire kind of loops around there. What exactly is going on in there? It's just a bunch of wires heading for the same terminal. It looks like the solder's kind of cracked off that terminal there. That's what it looks like. So this guy now, with the crack. Um, so there, there, that's got to be the 10 ohm resistor there. Uh, yeah, because body end dot, brown, black, black. So that'd be one zero with no zeros. So that's 10. So that's but there's no capacitor laid up against it. There's this one. There's nothing laid up against it. The only capacitor you could lay up is this one. This is the 6000. But I think it's the 6000 because of those markings there. Yeah, I can read it upside down. 6000. So that's a 6000 supposed to be laid up against this. I also said keep the leads as short as possible. Certainly managed to do that. And I also said dress it away from the chassis. Not not terribly well done here. And the, the bottom line too is it's all buried under all this stuff here. So that that's the deal. That's the guy I've got to lay up against the resistor. So the rest of these. Um, they just change them out as they are. So I got this guy. Wow, this is taking a long time. This guy, this guy, the one down under here, plus this one, and, and this one back here. You got five, five capacitors in the front end. Uh, I, think, I think that's all it amounts to, really. Five capacitors in the front end. Okay, so you can see how I've cut my other camera here looking straight down into the uh, into the into the uh, radio the capacitors back here the resistors even harder to get at down there and they're not much easier to see in this camera either Except, uh, this is the capacitor I'm going after and the resistor is right right here behind these wires so you're having trouble seeing it. Okay, uh, maybe I can shove the camera in a little further maybe. Yeah, there we go. Now you can see on the resistor in the background it looks like the seam is cracked on it. That's not necessarily the case. Very good. So that's a 10 ohm resistor. Oh my gosh. Okay, and you also see this capacitor here is kind of in the way for my work. So I'm going to release this capacitor, swing it out of the way. I'm just going to cut one lead. Because goodness knows if I cut both leads, I'll be wondering where this capacitor came from. Okay, pull that out of there. It gives me better access to this terminal down here. Okay, so the resistors 
here. And the capacitor. Resistor is up on this post. I'm going to be replacing this capacitor too. So I'm just going to cut away the resistor. I'll leave some wire there. Okay, and then we'll cut the other lead. See how it's coming through the hole in the chassis there? That's going up to the, the uh, tuning capacitor. Let's see if I can get in there. Six thousand. Okay. Nice big space in there now. So this capacitor is out with the resistor here. Put those there. We'll test that capacitor later. Now I'm gonna take my tan. So so one of these leads goes to the same place in the radio and the other two go to different places. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to solder this up like this. And then we'll uh, fix this into one spot and then from there these will be rigid and I can, can bend them into and bend them in and hook them up. Keep these capacitor leads as short as possible. Uh, that's a that's a that's a difficult combination of stuff in there. Okay, let's see if I can stick it in. Let's just see if I can even get it close to being the right dimensions and everything. Do the, re the resistor end up here first, actually. And then do the uh, the other end down as low as I can get away with. Tough decision here. up. While we're waiting for the soldering iron, my new antenna is a, my new outdoor antenna is a loop antenna. Approximately 40, is it 40 meters per side? No, can't be that much. Can't remember now. It's 75 meters, 85 meters total. So that's uh, 85 yards. 275 feet, something like that. My house is in the middle of it. 
was quite worried that because it's not out, out in a, a little bit of it is freestanding, but a lot of it is up against my house, up against railings, going through trees. But uh, what a difference it makes, and I, I think it makes the difference because the impedance of the antenna itself is very, very low because it's a loop. It's basically a short circuit in a sense, and uh, the low impedance. Uh, makes it impervious to, to noise. Okay, let's see if we can get this in here now. Okay, so I've got the capacitor and resistor in there. Let's take a close look, make sure I got it okay. Just in case I don't. So there they are laid up against each other. And they're soldered down there. Let's do the wiggle test here. Soldered in solid. Okay, this is the other end of the resistor. Oh, that doesn't look so good, does it? <laughs> Looks perfect. Uh, so there probably is a connection there, but it's not nearly what I want. So it looks like the lower wire there that hooks around, uh, hooks upward, coming from the terminal, never got hot enough. I think that's what happened there. It's probably just heat sinking into this busy terminal here. I have to take this capacitor out of here anyway. I'll make that next. You know what? I'm going to do that next. So maybe I'm going to rework this whole connection here. Okay, and then the last area was no, this part here. Capacitor connection. Uh, I can't get close enough here. Hang on. Hold tight. Yeah, that looks good. Great. Okay. On to this capacitor now. Oh, that's quite a crack in it. Okay, let's test a couple of a couple of capacitors here. So let's see. The uh, this is the six thousand guy. I'm doing a leakage test. Um, I'm just going to apply DC voltage to the capacitor. A little bit of leakage uh, will be reflected in this magic eye. See how it's open? During the test, if it opens up like that, good capacitor. But if it doesn't open back up like that, bad capacitor. So uh, 25 volts. There we go. Popped right open. Kind of quite, kind of fast. Let's try another one. So this guy's testing really good. No leakage at all. So we will measure his capacitance. Now this is a 0 0.006 microfarad capacitor. Just giving it a bit of time to discharge here. Okay. Uh, point. So 0 0.001 to 0.5. So 0 0.006 is going to be on here. You watch the eye for it to open. There's the spot. Quite distinct, huh? Okay, and we read that. We're on the 0.01 scale, 0 0.001, 0 0.005, 0 0.006. So this capacitor is actually in really good shape. That's the fact. That's the facts. That is the facts. So can't expect that to hurt. have hurt the radio much. Now the next one we're going to do is the one with the cracked shell. Okay, we're going to first do the leakage test on it. I found from experience, you just never know. Uh, you know, you can look at the condition of a capacitor and make some assumptions, but that's all they really amount to. Okay, so we're ready. 25 volts, same thing. I should pop back open. What do I? So it, it's fast because this is a very small capacitor. 150. So there's no leakage in this capacitor at all. But the question is, is it still what it's supposed to be, value-wise, which is 56. 56. Okay, so 56 picofarads. Oh my gosh, that's way down here somewhere. 56, so let's 
point zero zero. So I think that's ten. Starts at ten, I think. Oh, it's already open here. There's the spot, quite clear. Okay, so what scale are we on? We're on the point zero 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 one. We're here. We're right around the point zero 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 five, which would be fifty. Which would be fifty picofarads, and I think and it's supposed to be fifty six. So again, another good capacitor coming out of this radio. By my reckoning, hope I getting hope I'm getting this right. Now the next one. This is supposed to be a 560. And we'll see. First, does it leak? If it leaks, we can't really test it on this tester for its actual capacitance. Leak at 25? No. 250? No leak on this capacitor. Not too surprising. 560 I think it's the same place here there it is so on um, the scale here <laughs> this is really a major strain to my brain here from point zero 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 one so from ten that's ten ten fifty one hundred two hundred five hundred ah, it's right on it's right on the money again this is kind of disappointing I'd like to know I'm replacing bad capacitors here but so far not the case okay so this guy is uh, Two two hundred twenty. Okay, my money's on it being a good capacitor here. <laughs> leakage. Two fifty. No leaks at all. What is this a two twenty? Look at that. Two twenty. It's right around, right around where it should be. Another actually excellent capacitor. And I'm wondering, well, why did I go through all that to replace them? Because of this one, the 3300. This is the guy. This is the guy that's going to make it all worthwhile. 3300. 25 volts. Does it leak? Oh, boy, oh, boy. 250 volts. So, 33 hundred picofarads is what that is. So that's a 3.3 microfarad. I think. 3.3 would be 0 .0, 0 Somewhere in here, I think. guess again okay so over here is where it's reading it's towards the end of the scale let's see if we can find it more in the middle of the next scale maybe that's a little better okay so on this scale 0.5 I'm sorry 0 0.001 0 0.004 0 0.004 it's 4,000. Oh, this is way off. Because there's 0 0.005 on the scale. i got to think about this. That's 4,000. Okay, you know what? It's supposed to be here. 33, and it's up here. It's, it's another good capacitor. So I, <laughs> well, you know, someday they were going to go bad, so I just got in there early. Oh my gosh, that's a lot of work. That's a lot of work. I need to switch cameras. Can you believe it? I just switched cameras. Wow. Well, we're going to turn it on now. So now the only question is, did I replace these properly?
that's really the only question. Okay, turning this guy on. Scratch my head and remember, it's all by power supply. Uh, still plugged in. Let's go on standby. Turn down the supply and voltage level here. Okay, let's turn on this guy. Okay, so we got one and a half amps flowing into the heaters. So now we'll raise up the B plus, and we should hear the radio. <laughs> there we go. Oh, not on standby. It work that way. Here we go. Fifty. One hundred. Fifty. I don't hear anything. There it is. It's very, very quiet. There could be all kinds of alignment issues that have happened now because I did all this work. I'd be happy if it was a little louder. That's. There's. A, could be no antenna. Not particularly true. Oh! Okay. So right now, uh, I'm taking out too much signal and sending it to my SDR radio, which we're not paying attention to right now. So I'm going to reduce the amount of signal to the SDR. Now we hear it. Still a little quiet. Let me tune it. Okay, so radio's still working. <laughs> Good show. Whoops. Okay, now, next I'm going to do a whole bunch of other capacitors. <laughs> They're all going to end up being good. And what this tells me is this radio has lived a good life. It's been in dry surroundings, inside somebody's house or something like that, all the way along. And that's why all those capacitors, especially these, I thought for sure these would be dogs. <laughs> They're not. Just as well to get rid of them, I guess, at this point. Anyway, okay, so thanks so much for watching. And uh, well, I got another eight or ten capacitors to change there. See ya.